I hope everyone is enjoying lunch. Uh, and I can tell by the conversations on our table, uh, we have a really, really good time. So I'm Svilena Tsekova. I'm one of the finance transformation partners in KPMG. And absolutely delighted to have you all here for this luncheon. I know, I know it's going to be a great conversation once we have our uh, speaker talk to us as well. It's, I have to read, I have to refer to my little cheat sheet here because Caroline Webb is an amazing, amazing keynote speaker that we were able to secure to come with us today. So she's an economist, she's a behavioral scientist and a best-selling author. And she's going to tell us more about her book, um, How to Have a Good Day, Harness the Power of Behavioral Science to Transform Your Working Life. Surely something we can all learn a thing or two from. Now, that's been published in 17 editions in over 60 countries. In addition to this, Caroline's thinking and thought leadership has been published in the HBR, The Economist, The New York Times, The Financial Times, The Washington Post, and many others that I didn't fit on the sheet. Um, she's a former partner in McKinsey, and she's actually still a special ad senior advisor there. Um, and interesting, what I found quite interesting in her story is at McKinsey's, Caroline set up a remarkable women program, and a program that still survives 10 years on. Uh, again, surely something uh, that we all would love to hear more about. So with that, over to you, Caroline. Would love to hear from you how we can be more remarkable. Thank you so much. Are you having a good day? Yes, of course you are. You're with the women in finance and operations. Fantastic to be here. Thank you for having me. So as Svilena has said, uh, I've spent quite a long time thinking about how to help professionals thrive and excel in their work. And you know, when we think about how we are at our best, of course, you know, some of that is to do with technical skills, especially in a room like this. And as some of that is to do with luck and economic conditions and whether your company, your organization is doing well. But I remember when I got especially interested in the everyday stuff, in the small everyday habits and behaviors that can under, underpin high performance. And it was fairly early in my second career as a management consultant. It was early in my tenure at McKinsey. And we had tumbled into, unexpectedly, an A-B test between two teams. And what had happened was that we had a huge project with a media company, and the work was to assess where they should expand. And since it was worldwide in scope, it was a massive project, and it was too big for one team. So we split the work across two pretty much identical teams. And the work was the same task to assess whether certain countries were good for expansion. The work was split quite carefully, so that each team had the same mix of easy and difficult countries to assess. There was the same boss, the same client, but what happened was very, very different across the two teams, which were also staffed with people of the same caliber. What happened was very different because Let's call the first team Team A. So Team A uh, was doing good work, solid work. For management consultancy, they were working pretty reasonable hours. And perhaps related to that, they were having a good time. You could tell there was just sort of an air of enjoyment about the team. Team B, not so much. Team B was not do doing uh, such great work. There were gaps in the analysis that was sort of unexplained, they were working, crucially, two hours a day longer than Team A, and with the same workload and the same tasks. And when you walked into the room with them, you could feel that there was a tension in the room. And you know, you know what that feels like. You can just sort of sense it without even being able to put your finger on what's going on. And I remember, first time I walked into Team B's team room, the first time I saw them brighten was when they showed me, very excitedly, their stack of takeaway, takeout menus. They had about 20 of them, and like, we've got Chinese, we've got Indian, we've got Thai. And I realized, and this was pre-Deliveroo and pre-Grubhub and so on, and I realized 
uh, initially I was quite charmed by this, you know, sort of suddenly they were looking quite bright and kind of enthusiastic. And then I realized, oh, this is because they never go home for dinner. Oh. And so, you know, what seemed charming suddenly became, you know, very sad making, and this sad face. So I thought, gosh, this is so fascinating. And when I looked at what each team were doing, it was really down to how they went about the work every single day. It was how they talked to each other, how they met, how they prioritized, how they organized their workload, and so forth. And then I spent the next couple of decades thinking about that. And my toolbox for thinking about how to be team A rather than team B has always been behavioral science, because I had a first uh, career as an economist, and when you look at the research that is being done by behavioral economists, behavioral psychologists, behavioral neuroscientists, you really get so many pointers, so many clues on if you know how your brain works at its best, then you should work like this to be at your best more often. And it's transformative uh, just to understand a few things about what it takes for your brain to be at its best. So I'm gonna talk about three things today. And I have, I'm, I'm attempting to do a trick where I'm going to talk about one thing that's related to intentional leadership, one thing that's related to operational excellence. Where are the operational excellence people? Yep, fantastic. And one thing related to innovation. So something for everybody. You can check me out at the end and see whether I manage that. All right, so intentional leadership. Um, now there's a lot that could be said about that. It's quite a deep topic. To illustrate the point that I want to make today, I, um, I'm going to get you to do a little exercise with me. I'm going to, in a moment, give you three seconds to do something. And I'm gonna ask you to count something at your table. And then when I get to zero, I would like you to very, very determinedly look back to me and give me a nod and not to turn your head at that point until I say you can. Does that make sense? Can I rely on you to do that? <laughs> of course I can. You're the most reliable people in the world. You're women in finance and operations. Woo! Okay. Yes. So, are you ready? Yes. yes. I don't know whether you are. <laughs> are you ready? Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you three seconds to count at your table the number of people wearing glasses. Three, two, one. Back to me. Okay, got it? Very good, very high performance group, I can, I can tell. I just, I just know you've all got the right answer. All right, so now I'd like you to yell out the number to me. Okay, fantastic. Nice and confident. Notice how confident you are about that. Notice how confident you are about that. Okay without turning your head, and I can see, by the way, <laughs> without turning your head, I'd like you to yell out the number of people at your table with brown hair. Go. Okay. A little less oomph in that answer. <laughs> A little bit more hesitation. If I were to ask you, were you more confident of your answer with glasses or hair? Glasses. Right, okay, now, there'll be at least some of you in the room who are saying, well, that's a stupid question. Of course you're more confident with the question that I asked you to focus on. I asked you to count people with glasses. Um, and yet, the thing is that what you've just demonstrated is probably the, what I think is the deepest finding from behavioral and cognitive sciences that can guide us as professionals, which is this. We cannot perceive everything. We have limited conscious attention. I mean, so limited, really. And we don't know what we don't know. We can process about 50 bits of information consciously. And we're surrounded by trillions of pieces of information at any given time. It's not just you know, the color of people's hair at the table. It's, it's the way that the light falls on every strand of Catherine's hair, <laughs> and indeed Sophie's hair, <laughs> and it's every object on the table. It's the contour of every object on the table. It's the way that uh, the room feels. It's the way that your body feels. It's all the interceptor, the in internal data as well. You cannot process all of it. If your brain tried to process all of it, it would crash like an overloaded computer. 
So we have a wonderful mechanism, which is that your brain is constantly trying to prioritize. What is it that you notice consciously with your little bit of conscious attention? And that means that we are filtering out a ton of stuff as our brain just has us focus on what seems to be most relevant for us. We fill in the gaps around with guesses and suppositions. And the thing is, what becomes most interesting for us is that there is a rule of thumb that our brain follows to decide what's interesting and important enough for us to notice consciously among the sea of everything we could see, hear, feel. And it's this. Broadly speaking, your brain decides what's important enough for you to notice based on what's currently top of mind for you. It makes sense, right? Because it's trying to figure out, well, what's most relevant? Okay, well, I'm gonna use whatever seems to be on your mind. And that's why you were looking for glasses and you saw glasses. Meanwhile, you filter out anything that is not glasses. Now, actually, you did pretty well in having at least a guess, you know? But the confidence level that you had with something that you were not looking for was obviously much lower. And that's happening to us all the time. We go into a meeting, we've got an aim, there's a project we're really excited about, we really want to get, a, get that point across, we want to make the point, make the point. So what do we notice? We notice every opportunity to make the point and say the positive thing and to boost the project. What might we miss? I'm not saying we will, but what are we more likely to miss? Well, kind of everything else. We, we might conceivably completely miss someone making a comment that should give us pause on this thing that we're very positive about. We might not even hear the comment at all because we don't know what we don't know. And that is something that as leaders, as professionals, we really want to slow down and say, okay, well, hold on, what is my aim here? What is it that I want to notice? And the thing is, it's not even just having an aim as concrete as, well, I want to get my point across, or I want to count the number of people with glasses. You take that aim into your next meeting, or go great, I'm sure. Um, it's also our attitude that filters what we are able to perceive, what our brain decides is important. So, there was a study that was done with a group of people like you, lovely people, signed up. The psychologists who were running the experiment split the group into two, let's say right down here, and gave everybody a little test to take and put half of the room randomly in a bad mood by telling them that they had failed the test. Let's say you passed the test, so you're perfectly happy. You're just a little bit ticked off because it's a stupid little test and the scientists have told you you failed. Okay. Then they're given, everybody's given a description of an individual to read, and it's written very blandly, very neutral. And the scientists ask the people, well, how likable is this person you've just been reading about? You guys, because you're in a perfectly okay mood, you think this person is perfectly likable. You guys, because you're in a bad mood, think this person is less likable. That's how profound and how subtle the effect is. If you spill coffee on yourself in the morning and you're in just a, you know, just a little, little, little annoyed or worried, you go into your first meeting, your brain will make sure that you are more likely to see things that confirm that the world is not a perfect place. Now, I'm not saying that that means that you're missing wonderful things, but you might be missing some good things. You might be missing some helpful comments that you're hearing. And assumptions, that can also be something that we have top of mind. You know, when we're assuming that perhaps a meeting is going to be problematic or a person is going to be challenging. Now, this happened to me last week. Uh, I was meeting a contractor who, um, in the previous meeting, had been, frankly, a real pain. Am I allowed to say that? There are other words I could use. <laughs> Uh, he was, he got very emotional about a particular point that he, and he was wrong and he, he was just sort of willing to die in a ditch and it really sort of dug in and it was so odd and I knew that he must have been just having a bad day and that's fine. The next meeting though, I'm ready to go into the meeting and I'm noticing that my assumption is he's going to be a complete jerk again. Of course, right? But I know how this works. So I took... 30 seconds to say, okay, guess he was a bit of a jerk last time. All right, I noticed that that is an assumption I'm making and my attitude therefore about the meeting is not as positive as it could be. What really matters here 
what matters most? Okay, what matters most is actually that I get the benefit of his tremendous, undoubted expertise on the stuff he really does know. And therefore, what do I most want to notice? Okay, so what I most want to notice is actually chances to, for us to collaborate on areas that we haven't yet exploited. And with that, I had a good meeting with him, and we saw new ways to work together. And I was more likely to see those opportunities because of that little 30-second intention-setting routine. Now, don't get me wrong, he is still an emotional little puppy, right? <laughs> So setting intentions for your attention in this way doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to make the world a wonderful place, but it does mean that you're going to not miss the things that actually are pretty important that really matter. So 30 seconds. Check in with your state of mind. Uh-huh. Know that that's going to shape what you perceive. All right. What matters most? Okay. What does that mean I most want to notice? All right. So that's intentional leadership. Foundational piece of an intentional leadership. Where's the intentional leadership tables? Woo, okay, over to you afterwards. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, uh, where are the operational people again? Operational efficiency? Right, I'm going to, oh, there's only one table. Oh, this is all for you. And also anyone watching who's interested in operational efficiency. No, I'm kidding. I'm going to talk about personal operational efficiency, and this is relevant for all of us. And I'm going to get you again to do a little bit of work to demonstrate the point. I am going to ask you, to say the alphabet up, out to the letter G as fast as you can, A, B, C, D, F, G. If English isn't your first language, I'd suggest you do it in your, your, your mother tongue. Okay, so A, B, C, D, F, G, as fast as you can, with some energy, with some glasses energy rather than brown hair energy. <laughs> and I'd like you to do it on my mark. Are you ready? You know what I'm asking you to do, A, B, C, D, F, G. Okay, ready? Go. <laughs> Fantastic. And if you're watching, do this along with us too. Now, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing with numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, as fast as you can, with perhaps a bit more energy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. OK, are you ready? Go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ah, nice. Excellent. All right, now I'm going to ask you to do something that should take the same amount of time as the two of those things put together. I'm going to ask you to mix them up. I'm going to ask you to say A1, B2, C3, and so on, okay? As fast as you can. Are you ready? So ready. Okay. Go. Well done. Believe it or not, you just aced the task. You really did. Okay, so um, I'm going to just draw out what probably seems obvious. Um, when were you fastest doing it separately or mixed up? Separately. And when did you make more mistakes doing it separately or mixed up? Mixed up. Right, okay. And ta-da, you've just demonstrated decades of research into how the brain handles multitasking. Congratulations, <laughs> well done, yes. Including women's brains, I will say, right? Right. So um, that is what research suggests. There are a ton of studies on this. The numbers differ. Broadly speaking, you find that uh, when you are trying to do two tasks that require conscious attention in parallel, you are 30% slower. I mean, some, nu some numbers are much higher uh, because it also goes along with higher stress, so completion rates are actually also lower. Um, when you think about mistakes, typically when you multitask, you make between two and four times as many mistakes, which in the real world means you actually have to go back and do the stuff again, which actually takes more time. And this has been shown in the real world. It has been studied in workplaces where instead of letters and numbers, you know, we're dealing with calls and interruptions and pings and IMs and, and you know, what we're doing in effect is not actually doing the tasks in parallel, because if a task requires any conscious attention, what we're actually doing is we're asking our brain to switch wildly between them, because our brain can only do one thing consciously at a time. And so here we are, here's your brain. Right, letters, okay, numbers, letters, numbers. And in each of these small switches, calls, trying to read a thing, trying to write a thing, 
try and listen to the conference call that you're on. <laughs> <laughs> um, your brain is actually using a small amount of energy and a small amount of time to switch its focus. And that is enough, even though you don't notice it on a tiny level, it adds up to that kind of hit to your efficiency and your performance. Now, on the one hand, you know, I think we kind of know this. Like, you know that you are smarter and faster if you're not interrupted, I think, right? When you're pulled in all sorts of different directions, you know that it, it isn't great. And yet, we sort of let it happen. And that's partly because, you know, we now have always-on technology that allows us to, you know, have that happen. And yet, you know, I think we often don't stop to think about the, the hit to our ability to be at our best. There's um, a woman that I started coaching in January. Uh, her name's Lindsay. And we were having our first deep kickoff session, which is a you know, wonderful thing where I really get to know the story of someone's life, highs and lows, you know, st her strengths and so forth. And we were sitting there having this really quite you know, profound conversation. And I just kept on hearing from her bag, bing, bing, bing. She just, I, mean, I knew what it was. But eventually, I thought, well, it's too soon for me to say something about this. We're just getting to know each other, really. So I let it, let, let it continue for a while. And then eventually, I said, Lindsay, you know, the noise from your bag. And she said, yeah. Ha, 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 And that's kind of how we feel about it. We're just like, yeah, we're really interrupted. And we're, you know, it's, it's very stretching. We, we kind of laugh it off. We think, oh, it's, it's a bit, bit of a pain. But it's, you know, it's part of the price of doing good work in a modern global organization. But it's not always going to be necessary for you to respond immediately. In fact, research has found that we typically assume that a response is needed immediately. And actually, it very rarely is. There's a mismatch between what we think is needed and what is actually needed. And certainly, if you've got a 25-minute meeting, the chances that you are needed within, with all respect, with what you do, you are not going to be called into surgery for a patient that needs you within the next 10 minutes. Right? I know that what everybody does is so important and so profound, but most things can wait for 25 minutes or 55 minutes. And so that's what Lindsay started to do because she was talking about how frazzled she was. She simply got into the practice of putting her phone on airplane mode in meetings. And all of this space, her mental space opened up. And it's been remarkable to see the change. And what she's working on now is batching her email processing so that she has a look between meetings and then she really blitzes her email a couple of times a day and her, her messages. And that's making all the difference. So I'd encourage you to think, okay, well, what one little thing could give me back a little bit more mental space? Could I do a little bit more single tasking? Is there a really important conversational task today that really deserves my full attention, deserves the 30%? in terms of speed, deserves the fewer mistakes, deserves the greater insight, and that I can switch off my phone or switch off whatever is pinging at me to give it my full attention. So that's operational leadership, personal operational leadership, um, uh, efficiency. Now third, I know a lot of you are thinking about innovation today. Is that right? Yes, all right. So uh, let's talk about innovation. I am actually not gonna get you to do the work uh, but I'm going to get you to imagine that you're doing the work. I'm going to uh, get you to imagine that you're co at a conference in Rome 10 years ago, which is where I am mentally as well. And it's a room that's very similar to this, round tables, people sitting around, people eager to learn and connect and so forth. And I am, at that point, still a partner at McKinsey, and I've been asked to do a session for my McKinsey colleagues on behavioral science. So I say, great, fantastic, here I am. Uh, and I want a topic to work on that feels real so we can apply behavioral science to it. So I say, okay, we're gonna talk about how to improve internal conferences like this. And I'm like, okay, fine, fine. Now, what they didn't know was that Although I had been very clear about the fact they were going to get into pairs and think about ideas to improve internal conferences, what I hadn't told them was that half the room had a different set of instructions. 
I ask them to pick up the card on their table and follow the instructions on the card to the letter. So they did. They got into, got into their pairs. They picked up the card. Now, let's give you guys a break. You guys were the negative people. Right, OK. So all right, we're going to give you a break. So you guys pick up a card that says, think about the worst internal conference you've ever been to, and then think about what ideas uh, you have for improving internal conferences. And at the end of your allotted time, you're supposed to sort of enter this into the iPads that are on the table, and then my team processes that. You guys, you're asked to think about the best internal conference you've ever been to. Same question then, and what ideas do you have about improving internal conferences in general? So you're all working away. The team then is sort of processing this, and then the results come back, and I feel like I'm sort of on Eurovision. Um, or what would be an equivalent in, uh, in other parts of the world. No, Eurovision now covers the whole world, apparently. <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm, I'm reading off the results and I'm saying, OK, the results of the experiment are that. And they're like, what experiment? I say, OK, so you guys came up with 45% more ideas than you guys. And this is a group of really competitive consultants. So everyone's in a sort of state of high dudgeon and sort of saying, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? I said, well, you were framed rather differently. You had a negatively framed question. You had a positively framed question. And you might say, well, number of ideas is not a marker of quality. Fair enough, right? I mean, it could have been bollocks that they were typing into the iPad. Um, but I did also ask them to rate the quality of the conversation. So we had a proxy for that. And you guys rated the quality of the conversation 22% better. So what was going on? Why were you more creative, more innovative, more generative? Uh, it is down to the way that our brain handles stress. And if you think about uh, yourself as I'm talking about this, I, I suspect it will ring, ring true to you. So your brain at any given time is scanning the environment around you for possible rewards to seek out and discover, you know, not just food and, and money and so forth, but psychological rewards like a sense of competence, a sense of being in control, a sense of possibility. And these sorts of things light up our brain's reward system. They make us feel motivated. And then we're also scanning for possible threats to defend ourselves against. And what happens is that if any of those quantities and qualities that we think of as rewards gets undermined in any way, you know, if we feel incompetent or we feel like things are out of control, there's no sense of possibility. That tends to get coded by our brains as a threat. And that provokes, to a small degree or a large degree, a defensive response, which we know of as fight or flight in a lot of contexts. And what we often don't know, I think, is that that's not just going to impact our behavior. So when someone is feeling a little incompetent, a little bit out of their depth, a um, little stuck, uh, it can create a, a stress response. Uh, we know that that might make them a bit fighty, so that's snappish comment. We might see that they're being more flighty, which is sort of more avoidant behavior. Um, but what we often don't realize is that when that response is happening, there's less activity in their brain's prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is part of the brain that's responsible for uh, sophisticated reasoning and planning and forward thinking and ideation. And ooh, that's quite interesting because then what it means is that when we've got a ch challenging, tricky topic that's facing us and we feel a little bit stuck and out of our depth, we can actually become dumber just at the moment that we want to rise to that challenge. And that's happening to other people as well. So now that starts to become very interesting for us in thinking about, well, how do we frame challenges so that we keep ourselves and other people out of defensive mode as much as possible, knowing that we are generally dumber in defensive mode and stay in discovery mode where we're more focused on the potential rewards in a situation. And you know that sounds quite complicated, but the simple differentiation of me saying, think about the worst conference you've ever been to, and you think about the best conference you've ever been to, is enough to push your brains more towards discovery mode and push your brains more towards defensive mode. 
because even seeing a frowning face or a smiling face has been shown to make a difference. So this is something that we can use as leaders when we're you know, in the weeds and we're stuck in something and we're working with a team. It's not to say you don't want to think about the things that aren't working. Of course you need to dig into that. But if you can ask questions like, um, when have we solved a problem like this before and what can we learn from that? Or, where are things going well and what can we learn from that? When have you seen this done well and what can we learn from that? Then you're going to unlock a certain degree of creativity and insight and innovation, which was always there all along, but suddenly becomes accessible to everybody around you. So with these um, three little habits, so being intentional about where your attention goes, single tasking as much as you can, even if it's just two minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, and asking yourself positively framed questions in order to unlock insight and innovation, I think I can say that you will be team A all the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>I'm very happy to um, take questions if we've got a little bit of time. I don't know whether we do. If not, oh yeah, we're okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, hi, thank you for that. That was really informative. Um, I'll definitely be trying those experiments on my kids when I get home. <laughs> um, just a quick one on that. I totally agree with you about multitasking and how that doesn't work, but how does the science explain driving? Yeah. When you're driving and you're taking in so much information, pedestrians, yeah. traffic lights, and yeah. at the same time, you're having an in-depth conversation with the person next to you. Yeah, excellent, excellent question. Um, so our brain can do things that do not require conscious attention in parallel, truly in parallel. So things that we do on autopilot, we can do in parallel. And so, you know, that might mean brushing our teeth, like we're capable of looking at our phone while we're brushing our teeth. Although sometimes that can result in the phone falling into sync, which is, you know, uh, maybe that's just me. But, uh, you know, brushing our teeth is an, is an automatic task. Driving for many of us, when we're driving somewhere that's familiar in particular, is an automatic task. But what studies have shown, because driving, of course, is a really interesting one, is that the moment that anything changes in your field of vision that is not what you're expecting, that requires you to devote conscious attention suddenly, you'll notice that you don't want to be talking at that point. Like, you, you need to focus on the thing. And if you don't, you're more likely to have an accident. So that's the, that's the thing to remember. If something requires conscious attention, it's not something you can do in parallel. It requires your brain to switch and to focus. If something is automatic, listening to music that you're really familiar with that doesn't really demand any conscious attention, then you can do that in parallel. I hope that explains. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you again. That was um, some great words there. Um, I was just wondering, there's been a lot um, recently in the news um, about neurodiversity yeah. and um, as leaders, how we can best help those in our teams that might have ADHD or autism. Have you got any top tips? Um, because you might. <laughs> well, I think in, in general, you know, as, as leaders, as managers, we want to um, get a good understanding of the strengths of the people in our teams. And again, research is really clear that when we are thoughtful about what people's strengths are and figure out how to play to those strengths more fully, a bit like I did with my emotional puppy contractor, um, that uh, not only does individual performance rise, but team performance and organizational culture rises. So I think, you know, this is, this is one of the things that's worth doing when you're thinking about not just um, differential strengths in the way that we usually think about them, but also neurological strengths. You know, some people um, are able to kind of think broadly and, uh, you know, they're able to kind of scatter their attention and not be freaked out by that. Um, you know, think about whether there's something you can use in that. Same with, um, same with autism. Um, but I think in general, it is a question of, you know, thinking about, well, what, is, what are the conditions that are going to really help you thrive? Having a conversation with each individual 
understanding that and, and not trying to make one size fits all as much as you possibly can, recognizing you know, that we all have our quirks and actually that's gonna be useful for the neurotypical people in your team too, to have that conversation. Sure. And I guess we'll make this the last one because I know you wanna get into table conversations, so thank you. Yeah, again, I was very interested in everything you were talking about, but when you were talking about operational eff effectiveness and you know, our brains operate 30% slower mm. if we're multitasking, is that the same for men and women, or is there any gender differences in our brain and how it works? There don't seem to be. Um, there don't seem to be gender differences in the studies. Um, it goes back to the earlier question. I think that one of the reasons why we've ended up with a perception that women might be better is because so much of what we have to deal with is so often on our plate that it has become somewhat automatic. And so we are able to... Uh, juggle things that other people can't juggle because we are used to it. So there's a degree of habituation. Um, that said, everything that we see in the research also suggests that, you know, you might be doing all right juggling all this stuff, but there's a sort of performance delta that is still on the table. If you were able to bring your attention more regularly to just one thing at a time, what might that allow you? We, you know, we don't have the counterfactual in place of you know, looking at well, what if that were not the case? What if you were not stretched all the time? How much more insight and performance might you get from yourself? So that's, that's the second answer I would give to the question. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Wonderful to meet you all. Thank you for having me.